Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and welcome to Genetics. Today we're going to take a look at some of the earliest history of genetics, particularly the idea of how information, which is really what genetics is, biological information, we want to know how information gets passed down from parents to offspring. Throughout the ages, just by looking around and not being very scientific, it's clear that parents give information somehow to their children if you're talking about humans, and the same goes for most animals and even other types of organisms. We're calling today's lecture Mendelian Genetics, as it was named after the person who's often referred to as the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. He's the first that gets credit for actually doing experiments, keeping detailed records, and really proposing a theory about how this happens. So technically, we're going to look at monohybrid crosses, which he did. And he came up with a law that he called the law of segregation. Sometimes we call it Mendel's first law today. So let's start by seeing uh, some general historical facts and ideas about genetics before Mendel, because for most of human history, let's face it, people knew very, very little about how information was transmitted from parents to offspring. So as I mentioned, Gregor Mendel is often referred to as the father of genetics. Before Mendel, and he did his work in the mid to late 1800s, almost nothing was known about genetics. There were observations made even by non-scientists, just common sense observations that led people to believe in a theory that they called and we still call today a blending inheritance type of an idea. You can think of blending inheritance in the following way. It's as if whatever information is being donated by a father, for example, uh, people didn't know what that information was, obviously, but they, some information was coming from the dad, some information was coming from the mom. And you could think of it as almost literally getting mixed up in a blender, just homogenized into some kind of hybrid type information. And that's what ended up in the offspring. The reason it was thought that this was the case is because you can make observations, well, you could make them now and you could have made the same ones then. For example, if a very tall individual was to have a progeny with a short person, then the offspring very often had a height that was somewhat intermediate in between the tall and the short, sort of blending them together. If someone with very dark skin had an offspring, a child with someone with very light skin, by the same idea, very, very often, the child's uh, skin coloration was somewhere intermediate between the two parents. And you can think of a lot of examples like this. So it wasn't really crazy to think about blending inheritance. In fact, a lot of real world, uh, real world examples seem to give credence to that idea. Well, Mendel was the first to really do some very strict experimentation based on sound principles to keep very good records. And he proposed theories of inheritance that actually made sense and very importantly were testable. And we can almost do the exact same type of crosses that he did today. So I guess it's logical to ask and answer what exactly did he do? Well, firstly, Mendel chose to use the pea plant, the common garden pea of the genus Pism. And why did he use that? I mean, he wanted to get at some general principles of genetics. Um, at the time, of course, he didn't know if the genetics of the pea plant was going to be different than that of the fruit fly or whoever else. But basically, this may seem silly, but it's true. They were available to him. He had some pea plants. He was, um, as the story goes, an Austrian monk who was, he was a teacher, but he also took care of the garden and he was very into his plants. So he had peas, so why not use them? Very importantly, peas, as well as most other plants, can either self-pollinate or they can cross-pollinate. What this means is that unlike humans and many animals, most plants have both the male and the female sexual organs together in the same flower. So you can take roughly the equivalent of sperm, which is pollen from a plant, and you can put it right from the same plant pollen right onto the uh, receptor for the egg. And basically it would be the equivalent of, this sounds very strange, but of a person literally having 
sex with themselves from a genetic perspective. Obviously, we can't do that, but pea plants can. And you'll see that this is very important to the experimental design that Mendel came up with. By the same token, though, you can cross-pollinate them, which would be a sort of more traditional sexual uh, exchange of information where the pollen from one plant is used to fertilize the eggs of another plant. So it's very important that that can be done, uh, the self and the cross-pollination. Also, they produce many offspring. So when you do a statistical analysis, you may know that the more data you have, the better off the results are. Um, just to use humans as an example, humans can have a lot of kids, but a lot might be seven or eight, right? Uh, we're not talking hundreds. So it's better to have more data when you're trying to calculate results and see what they mean. Peas also have a short so-called generation time. And what that means is the amount of time from fertilization to the sexual maturity of an adult plant. So in peas, that's about two weeks. Again, to use humans as an example, our generation time is about 15 years. So we would have a long, long wait if we wanted to analyze all of the offspring of a particular um, cross. So for all of these reasons, peas were attractive in terms of um, being good for experimentation. And the last one may sound a little bit silly, but it's very, very true. Unlike animals, when you want to try and get them to breed and count them, they don't run away and say, I don't really want anything to do with this. So if anyone's ever worked with fruit flies, which are a model organism for animals, uh, you have to anesthetize them when you want to count them. And unless you do it very well, often they'll wake up and sort of fly away when you're in the middle of counting, and that can really compromise the experiments. Plus, they'll breed, but you can't actually force them to. In the case of peas, you just take a little paintbrush, take some of the pollen, and wipe it onto the uh, female part of the flower, and then you've done a fertilization event. So these, among probably even other reasons, are why the pea plant is a very, very good experimental organism. Now, Mendel studied seven traits altogether, and he used these traits very specifically because always these traits could be found in two forms, and only two forms, in the pea plant. So just as examples, pea plants have flowers that are either purple or they're white. There's no red, yellow, green, nothing in between purple or white. Mendel used the term, he called these antagonistic traits or antagonistic pairs. Uh, that terminology really is not used anymore, but if you happen to see it, it means it's really either or. You're purple, you're white, and those are the two variants. Uh, unlike in people, pea plants are either tall or short. I don't know the exact height, but in other words, there's not this range of heights. It's tall or short, one or the other. Green seeds versus yellow seeds, and so on and so forth. So the bottom line is there's always two variants of the trait, um, and it's one or the other that the trait comes in. So his experimental rationale is extremely important. Guys, this is the bedrock of everything. If you don't understand this part, it's hard to go on to the, to the further parts, which is why we need to spend a little bit of time on this, or perhaps a lot of time on it. So we're going to use flower color as our example, not for any particular reason, except that I like flower color, and it's something very definite that you can see and, and keep track of. So the flowers of the pea plant, peasum, could be either, as I said, purple or white. That's really pretty much what the pea plant flowers look like there. And remember, there's only two, these are the only two possibilities with respect to pea plant flower color. Now, one very important thing to understand is that the whole basis of starting out the experimental rationale here is that there are pure breeding lines that either exist or can be created. Sometimes these are called true breeding. If you hear that term, it means the exact same thing. Now, if you have a pure breeding line of purple flowered uh, pea plants and a pure breeding line of white flowered pea plants, what this means is, let's take the purple line. If you self them, and the, the term self means to self-pollinate or self-cross. Um, in other words, if pollen from that purple plant is used to fertilize itself, the offspring will always be purple.